I was just looking this time. Like, oh. Yeah, yeah. So, so I was about to hit this spot right here. So if you're going to introduce Stephanie, then yeah. I'll just go take a seat. I'm, I'm gonna Good afternoon and thank you for joining us. My name is Tina Jordan and I'm the Vice President of Membership for FCA International. And I'm excited to welcome you to today's Emerging Leader Panel, 5G, Driving Data Dominance in the Pacific, brought to you by FCA's Emerging Leaders and coordinated by the Hawaii chapter's own Brandon Lester. For those of you who may not know, Emerging Leader is FCA's term for our professionals under the age of 40. But I want to stress that the individuals on this panel are not here on the panel because they're under the age of 40. They're here on the panel because they have expertise and experience and just look at the world in ways that we need to hear. And they just happen to be under the age of 40 as well. But before we start the panel, I would like to invite to the stage Alicia Kelly, Business Development Director for Trace System and the co-president of FCA International's Emerging Leaders. And I'd like Alicia to talk to you a little bit about our Emerging Leader Program. Thank you, Tina, and good afternoon, everybody. I know this is the last panel of the session, which has been a fantastic event for TechNet and Opaycom, so thank you to Linda, Tina, and everyone really that had a part in organizing this event this week. We're all very happy to be back. So as Tina mentioned, my name is Alicia Kelly, and I run the Emerging Leaders. I'm the co-president for the Emerging Leaders at the international level. I've been working with this group of people for seven or eight years now, and I can't tell you how impressive it is to see just the insights that people can bring to any discussion, and especially people that are under 40. Uh, from my perspective, I think that putting together panels like this really brings uh, new levels of information and new levels of collaboration that sometimes are difficult as we move throughout our day-to-day -day operations. So without further ado, uh, if you guys ever have any questions about the emerging leaders, please feel free to find me. I'm readily available on LinkedIn. I share my number entirely too much, and I'm very passionate about this, so I'm always happy to talk about it. So thank you all for being here. Okay, and with that, I would like to introduce the moderator for today's panel, and that is Stephanie Hutch. Stephanie is the founder and president of Mackay LLC, a native Hawaiian-owned 8A firm. Mackay specializes in DOD weapon systems integration and wireless and wired network modernization. Stephanie serves as the co-chair of Women in FCA and is the co-chair on the FCA International Membership Committee. Stephanie is very busy, and we certainly appreciate the time that she took to put together this panel. So with Stephanie, let me turn it over to you, and please join me in a warm FCA welcome for Stephanie Hutch. Thank you, Tina. Aloha, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. As um, Alicia mentioned, this is the end of the conference. I'm really thankful to see all of you here today. I'd like to start just by introducing our panelists. Um, their full bios are up on the website, so this is just an abbreviated uh, bio right now, but we'll start with Michael here next to me. So Michael currently serves as the Associate Director for the 912 Institute. Um, he assists 912 partners in end-to-end -end solution development. Some of these included the first CBRS private cellular network with integrated Starlink backhaul, image recognition, and edge processing, leveraging millimeter wave and quantum resilient message-based encryption over a 5G network. Next to him, we have William, or Will. Will is an engineer for the Naval Information Warfare Center Pacific, NAWICPAC, in Hawaii, in the Advanced Development and Experimentation Branch within the ISR Division. As part of his work, Will is integrating commercial, private 5G networks to meet DOD missions, and is focused on distributed mobile, edge, mobile access edge compute with cloud native networking and open radio access networks, ORAN, uh, with software defined radios. Will received his bachelor's in electrical engineering from University of Hawaii at Manoa 
and his master's in electrical and computer engineering from UCLA. And then, last but not least, on the end, we have Bobby. Bobby is currently serving as a senior advisor for 5G technologies and innovation with Vectris. He is focused on 5G SATCOM convergence, modernization, solutions and strategy, business development, and identifying technology partners across JADC2 mission sets. While with Vectris, Bobby has operationalized joint service 5G SATCOM and C5ISR strategies for all domains, including persistent ISR spectrum management, automation of C2 battle management applications, and on the move and at the halt uh, resilient, secure cloud, and on-prem communications. So welcome, thank you very much panelists. I'm so happy to have you up on stage with me. I wanna just jump into it. I'll start here with Michael, um, the question that we're all wondering, you know, what is 5G? You know, why is it important and why should the DOD care and different use cases? Yeah, it's a good question. We get dealt with this all the time and I think all my peers up here can admit a lot of our job now is education uh, because 5G is not just the next G. It is kind of a quantum leap in the technology sector from 3G to 4G to 4G to 5G. They're actually coining it now kind of the fourth industrial revolution with its capability. Um, so what does it include? It's really a basket of technologies. It's not just one thing. It's not faster speeds, lower latency. We're starting to talk about things like spectrum, opening up millimeter wave, mid-band spectrums. We're talking about network slicing, edge compute, cloud, IoT devices, mass device connectivity, things like that. So we've begun to exponentially grow what it means to just say 5G. So it takes a lot of people in the room to, to develop a true end-to-end -end solution to actually serve the needs of the, of the end user. And some of the use cases that we can start to talk about are things like AI-driven insights. We can start to talk about other things that really have this wide array of um, expanded throughput, lower latency characteristics, autonomy, whether you're on the commercial side and you're starting to talk about autonomous driving or you're starting to talk about pattern recognition on different areas. Um, those use cases really kind of call for the need for 5G to really implement in the scenario so that way we can actually start to do the kind of concepts that traditionally weren't available to us. Um, so as we start to then scope you know, we kind of talked earlier, one of the things we talk about is we can't just go into somebody and say, give me 5G. We have to start with what is your problem and I'll tell you how to solve it with 5G. Um, the kind of reference I use all the time is kind of like Baskin Robbins. You have to go in and choose your flavors of 5G, kind of what you want out of this so that way you can actually get the best impl implementation to solve your problem set. Um, but yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so Will, uh, for you, you know, you're working on Island here with um, OUSD. What are some of the 5G related capabilities and features uh, that you're kind of focused on in the near term, say the next five years or so? So, uh, sorry, all of that, no, just kidding. But uh, for real, I mean, with the work that I'm doing, I'll talk about my day job a little bit with the uh, Joint Base Pro Arbor Hickam 5G initiative sponsored by OESD. So uh, they have a whole 5G initiative with 12 tranche sites across the United States, and I'm lucky enough to be the network lead for the Joint Base Pro Arbicum 5G initiative. So uh, I'll get through my main points real quickly with a little bit of real attention I'll get from you at the beginning here, and then I'll go into more detail. But uh, some of the tech that we're really looking at is the 5G tech that lends itself to resiliency to operate in our DOD mission set whenever and wherever that is. So what I'm talking about there. So uh, some of the technology that I've been particularly interested in is like uh, Steph mentioned earlier was uh, cloud native and software defined networks. Because now that quantum leap that Michael was talking about earlier is now you're, you're able to scale up and down your network functions at the speed of software and that gives you a level of adaptability and scalability and reallocation of your network resources in a way that's most efficient. As you know, the DOD mission changes almost on an hourly basis, so <laughs> having this kind of capability in 5G is really important. Uh, another good technology is mobile access edge compute, really being able to deploy your cloud compute resources to the edge where you actually need them. Uh, that's really important for the DOD here. Uh, and uh, the final one is backhaul diversification most recently. It's just with non-terrestrial networking and release 17 of 3GPP, that's really exciting. But 
Also, I bring that up because of a problem that Hawaii faces itself with a lack of backhaul going back to the U.S. mainland. So I don't know if you all are familiar with this, but uh, our lifeline, so to speak, back to the U.S. mainland is through limited undersea fiber cable. And this isn't a secret, by the way. <laughs> there have been many RFPs since 2005 to try and get this to expand because undersea fiber has become so... The, the technology has progressed so much that you can now directly connect the U.S. West Coast directly to Asia, which means whatever undersea fiber we have now, that's all we're going to have in the future with our growing population and growing needs. I mean, 5G is really just the beginning of our increasing network requirements. So kind of my way to, or the two ways I see to approach this problem is one, like I said earlier with MEC, by reducing the amount of backhaul traffic you need to go back to the US mainland. Having all of the apps and services that you need at the edge where people are actually using them, you reduce the requirement on your undersea fiber. The other, the other technology I mentioned of, of backhaul diversification, I'm not sure if all of you are familiar, but there's a Starlink gateway that opened up recently on Molokai. So we now have Starlink and hopefully other proliferated low Earth orbit constellations coming up to help support and increase our pipe and lifeline back to the US mainland. Um, yeah, so those are the technologies that I believe really lend themselves to uh, resiliency and operating in the DOD. I mean, obviously it's not a comprehensive list and we're looking at the entire basket that Michael is talking about. I mean, I think that's, and you can keep a counter of how many times I'm gonna mention the OUSD initiative here. But the OUSD initiative really lends itself to creating a test bed where we can demonstrate all of these capabilities and show how they can be useful for the DOD mission and hopefully not just in the DOD mission set but to Hawaii in general. So what you've heard all this conference about workforce retention, uh, our diversification of our economy out here, resiliency, redundancy, 5G is just this nice inflection point for all of us, not just in the, D the DOD and the US in general, it's an inflection point for us to look at our aging infrastructure, see where we can improve and innovate out here so that we can become proper citizens of the digital age. Thank you. So that's a great segue to talk about infrastructure when we think about the distributed bases across the Pacific region. Bobby, I'd like to give you a chance to kind of talk about or talk to some of the challenges um, from a design perspective and even infra infrastructure perspective. Uh, with, with some of the base networking infrastructure. Sure, aloha. I want not every, everyone to just kind of just take a quick blink, right? So the reason for that is because part of 5G is really about low latency. And what you just did, if you just blinked, you know, you, you basically went from uh, 100 to 400 milliseconds. In, in the 5G world, we're looking at less than one millisecond. Um, and the reason for that, when I asked that question, if you can do that, is because when you look at data traversing over these networks, um, these are network of networks between SATCOM, 5G, your, the integration between these networks. And so, you know, looking at that from that perspective is really important to understand um, from an operational standpoint how this data is going to traverse over these networks. Um, when you look at the carrier's capability, you look at 5G private, uh, fi private 5G networks, you look at different architectures, Morin and, and, and Moken architecture, sharing RAN services, network splicing, et cetera. So when you look at this, uh, you know, 5G from, from that standpoint, the goal be besides operationalizing 5G is building out these networks and designing these networks. So from that standpoint too, um, I have a couple of, couple of points that I just wanted to, um, uh, hone in on. Number one, uh, when you look at operationalizing 5G and design, I think we all have heard the term digital twin, but the term digital twin is now reality. To be able to deploy these networks faster, uh, time to market, time to the mission, to the field, to the warfighter, we have to be able to build these resilient networks 
um, very quickly. And one way to do that is to provide uh, a digital twin. And for, for those that don't know what digital twin means is being able to emulate and simulate various types of networks very quickly, in, almost in a sandbox environment, but still being able to provide um, and test uh, those networks prior to deployment. Secondly, RF characterization. Um, we just don't deploy 5G for the sake of 5G. 5G networks and the spectrum that's associated with 5G um, has to be handled very delicately. I think we all know that you just don't deploy 5G on a flight line, um, right? You know, in Tinker or, or any other base, right? You have, you have procedures and policies that you have to adhere to, um, host nations, uh, ITU mandates, et cetera, in order to deploy different types of networks on, on our bases here in, in the United States and abroad. And then finally, looking at our uh, 5G, 5G networks are, are interesting in the, in the sense that you have different types of 5G networks, different types of use cases. Um, you have strategic networks, you have operational networks, you have tactical networks. So it's not that one 5G network will fit all, it's more of identifying what type of 5G network does our, do our customers, our DOD customers and teammates need and how we build those, um, build those networks accordingly. So in the context of the Indo-PACOM region, you know, what we've talked about a lot at the conference, um, looking at some of the specific challenges that are unique to this area of the world, I'll open it up to anyone here you know, who wants to kind of take the first response on it, but what are some use cases of 5G that we're seeing you know, deployed currently, real world use cases? And you know, the counter to that is when are, or under what circumstances would 5G or kind of that basket of technologies not be appropriate? I'm going to go first. Go I ahead, guess. sure. Uh, just to first piggyback off of their two comments previously, you know, 5G is really this inflection point of this unified architecture. So whenever we were talking about <clears throat> dissimilar networks and dissimilar protocols, with the 3GPP spec, this is the first time in a release where they've actually in included other protocols and other capability, backhaul capabilities, so on and so forth, because they see that pro proliferation of networks and the need to have this unified architecture you know, if you're forward deployed and you have one, one battalion operating one network and another there, sometimes things can go missing in the data, right? We don't want people um, losing out or potentially causing risk to other battalions or forward operating troops to be able to then say, how can I have a, a unified architecture that can lay over the top of dissimilar networks and then actually give us a unified schema that we can actually leverage um, for the, the greater command and control? Um, in regards to the Pacific, you know, one of the things we've seen and that we kind of dial in on is the Pacific is large. And specifically, some of the other people on the other side of the Pacific have large numbers that just directly outnumber us. So we have to fight in a different way. We can't fight numbers to numbers. So we can leverage some capabilities of 5G in order to then create better odds for ourselves. So we can use things like image recognition with artificial intelligence, using mech technology, things like that. Again, that lower latency that we talked about, um, one key characteristics that we can relate is latency has an inverted relationship to response time. So if I can drive that latency extremely far down, I can increase my response time in order to, to execute on the things that I want with the amount of data that I actually need to make those um, verified decisions that I need. Another thing that's actually uh, inherent here in the Pacific is island chains. So it's how do we create mesh network on island chains? How can we disseminate information between those nodes um, with a heterogeneous network in order to actually benefit the greater ISR mission? So, Right, and I'd like to jump on that as well. So everything Michael said, 1,000%. It's distributed networking, and I think 5G, although it's not the panacea, it's a good start yeah. to targeting the Indo-PACOM mission, and I won't say I'm an Indo-PACOM spokesperson, by the <laughs> way, I'm just an engineer. Uh, but, you know, MEC really pushes itself towards that mission of moving island to island, being able to work even if you're denied uh, connectivity back to your U.S. mainland or wherever your base of operations may be. I, I mean, you have all of these, I, I, some of the technologies I've seen just at this conference, I mean, with the software factory, it's not new by any means, but uh, 
having the software factories and being able to develop capability right at the edge, right where the users are going to be, right as their missions are evolving, that's something that's really powerful for us and being able to leverage some of the things like automation, AI, to multiply your force. I think that's really important, especially to the point, Michael, you just said that there are people on the other side of this pond who have much larger numbers and we need to really take advantage of this open environment that 5G is lending itself to, to really push American ingenuity. I, I think that's one of our greatest strengths is just having this open environment. Now with 5G, it, it's, it's just opened up. So to, in order to break in, you don't need to have a large amount of capital expenditure like you may have needed in the past. And I, I think that's really the great thing about cloud native networks and, and software defined networks. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that, but one more plug for the OUSD initiative. But for the Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam 5G initiative, we are pushing a hybrid infrastructure where we're seeing where commercial networks can help us complete DOD missions. So I think that's something that's really important for us because it's not going to be 5G overnight. Uh, I think the saying goes, Rome wasn't built in a day. Neither will 5G. It will be built in several days, I think. But, uh, you know, we're, we're always going to need to work with legacy systems. We're always going to need to work across different networks and, uh, you know, in their mission and partner environments. Being able to play along all these lines and play nicely, that, that's really where 5G gives us a great start. Yeah, great point. Um, you, you know, Michael, you made a great point around, around, around net mesh networking. Um, one of the things that comes to mind is beyond line of sight being able to have those communication lines out at the edge when there aren't any 5G networks, but yet you still have your own mesh capability where you can still communicate at the edge. Um, I wanted to share a couple other use cases uh, that, that I think are important around 5G as well. Force protection, for flight line maintenance, um, as well as uh, replenishment. I'll speak to mobilization. 5G smart warehouses. Why is that important? In order to mo mobilize our forces, we have to have smart warehouses, and 5G enables smart warehouses to be able to track, pick, pull, replenish our, our service women and men out in, the out in the fleet, out in the field. And lastly, um, being able to, when I say force protection, it's being able to connect legacy systems that are currently deployed right, seismic acoustic sensors, unmanned ground sensors, being able to integrate those types of, uh, those type of modalities into a 5G net to provide a better situational awareness, uh, single pane of glass. Yeah, and to, to deal with the drawbacks side of that question, um, I don't think inherently we'll call it the greater 5G has the drawbacks as much as its individual components. Um, so, you know, especially whenever we're looking at things like the Pacific, you know, like we just talked about, it's it's sea cable. So we may not have access to fiber. So maybe certain things like millimeter wave spectrum doesn't make sense for certain use cases because I may not have the fiber backhaul that can support the four gigabit per second front end. So then am I going to look at, okay, maybe I want to go with a mid band because I need further propagation. I need, you know, I need to match those speeds. Or then do I take a SATCOM, aggregate my SATCOM together to match my front end? Um, so in certain austere environments, certain parts of 5G don't lend themselves to necessarily be the use case. Millimeter wave, for instance, you know, you're talking, it can start to attenuate in fog or leaves or glass. So it doesn't make sense if you're actually forward deployed to potentially leverage a unified directed beam rather than a propagation wave. So in those instances, maybe you look at mid-band, maybe you look at a private network, depending on the use case. Maybe in some aspects you want cloud compute or you do want edge compute. If, you're, if your bottleneck is your pipe and you can't push that much data back, okay, then I need to do some pre-processing at the edge. Maybe I have an edge compute node, a mech, strategically located to pre-process my ISR and PED data before I send it back to command and control. You know, those kind of capabilities then, again, I use this Baskin-Robbins analogy again to say, okay, well, what is my problem? What flavor do I need? And how do I match these flavors together to actually give me my solution set that I'm looking for? Right, and I'll just say that's like the real strength of having this 5G environment. 
I, I mean, it, and by no means is it all going to be 5G that's going to tackle all of the Indopaycom uh, problems, right? It, it's just a nice sticker that gets everyone to look and say, hey, innovate here. And I think that's really strong because you, ha you now have this flexibility. I mean, gosh, in, in 4G LTE, your network functions used to be like big bricks of uh, <laughs> server racks, right? But now you can just host it in your hyperscale cloud or your edge cloud node. So just having that flexibility is something that's really important to achieving the mission, right? So I, I guess that's why I like Michael's Baskin Robbins approach there <laughs> because you can just pick any flavor that suits your mission, right? And maybe your taste will change in the hour or two. Yeah. You know, one, one last point too is one of the things that we're working on at Vectris is right here on island, right, with Red Hill. Um, though we haven't deployed a 5G network, but being able to, to implement different types of sensors that can help mitigate water, water waste, fuel management, et cetera. So, um, you mean, you know, being able to have networks that are in place that can also be integrated, a 5G network that can also integrate with industrial uh, networks as well is, is also important. And I guess one final thought for a drawback is, you know, we, we get some of these questions all the time that I want 5G. And if you're not careful with it, it can actually become a liability instead of a benefit. You know, we were talking this week, uh, Stephanie and I with some other folks, and they used a, the torch analogy. The torch is great because it can provide light, it can light your path, but if you're not careful, it can also burn your house down. Some of the convenient um, aspects of 5G are things like precise data tracking. So do I know where my message is going? Do I know who's seen it? But if you don't start with a zero trust architecture, if you don't start with the right cybersecurity schema, the problem is the people that do know it can then find you. And the last thing you want to do is expose anybody in your battalion or fleet to adversaries. So the last thing you want to do is light up a map of where all your strategic locations are. So you do have to be take it seriously and understand what you're looking at and how you implement it um, with those things in mind, zero trust and, and security built into it. Uh, before you even look at just saying, I do 5G. So I think the first takeaway is 5G is like ice cream, not sprinkles. That's it. You yep. can't just sprinkle some 5G on it. That's exactly right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to pivot a little bit. We've been talking about you know, present day, uh, current use cases, and now I want to shift a little bit to future. So, um, Will, we'll start with you. Mm -hmm. you know, what are some capabilities? You know, I, I started asking, what are you looking at in the next five years? But what's after that? So five, 10, even 15 years from a DOD perspective? Right, so I, I mean, I, I don't think those questions are actually too different, considering that 5G is just the start of revolutionizing the way that we network because of the software-defined nature, because of the way that you can now reallocate resources within seconds versus what it used to be days. I mean, all of the, all of the technologies I listed earlier and so many more of the other 31 Baskin-Robbins flavors like cloud-native networking, Mac backhaul diversification, like this is just the start to making fifth generation wireless more accessible and being able to innovate on it. So what I kind of see from here is we're, we've already been reducing the size of a mobile compute platform. I don't know if you remember 30 years ago uh, for like personal computing, it used to cost a lot to even think about owning a computer, right? I mean, not even 10 years before, the computers used to take up so many rooms. Uh, sorry if I'm getting my timeline wrong. I'm just going to say now that I'm a proud member of Generation Z. So, <laughs> so you know, like it, it's, it's really interesting that uh, we can go from 5G now using this as our starting point to move and make things smaller, to make high performance computing more accessible to common people where it used to be technology was only available to people with the means. Being able to diversify the user base really lends itself to innovation and providing solutions that not only for the DOD, uh, you're providing solutions for us as human beings, right? Uh, it, it becomes a great platform for you to demonstrate great capabilities and provide services to the people that need them. Uh, the, the great thing about 
the technologies I just listed is now you have this benefit of maybe a common computing fabric. I don't know if you have heard uh, Colonel Chu's integrating warfighter network, I think it was, <laughs> where you kind of have a common fabric that connects all of us around the globe and allows us access to these resources which normally are inaccessible if you don't have a good Wi-Fi connection. I mean, this pandemic itself, sorry to bring it up, I know it's taboo now that we're two years in, um, but this pandemic has really highlighted the inequities of access to your to resources that are necessary for not just DOD things, but uh, for accessing resources and solutions. Uh, education, for example, I mean, you, you couldn't, if you didn't have a good Wi-Fi connection, then suddenly you have some students who are stuck in the dark and now they have to put themselves at health risk to even try and gain an education for themselves. I think if we keep going along the path on 5G where we are now with mo making mobile access edge compute platforms even more accessible, I, I bring it back to like our education and workforce retention. If you make a platform like that available on island, and I know Michael's excited to talk about some of the efforts he's got going, uh, if you have that available on island, you make it open for K through 12, for university students. That's your workforce retention right there. That's your workforce development because the first step to any great solution is just playing around with it. Gosh, I mean, <laughs> many of the first great scientists were just in their garages or the equivalent in the 15th century just for the PG version messing around mm -hmm. and figuring stuff out. So I, I think it's really promising what 5G has to offer and the great attention that it's getting because, you know, yeah. you, you can really innovate off of that and get great solutions to the people that need it. I think you said two things, too, there that were really important. One is scaling down the compute. Uh, you know, we, we're, we're reaching now the stage with 5G offers mass device connectivity and with the micronizing the compute at the edge, we're really starting to see and integrate um, Soldier as a sensor. How can I take my assets and outfit them with IoT devices and actually be able to get real-time data over this 5G architecture in order to leverage things that traditionally have to have higher latency characteristics, call it radio ops, to be able to say, I see something, I need to act on it. If we can now start to distribute compute IoT devices, we can do image recognition real-time with a body cam on a Soldier in order to do real processing, real time, and then be able to then identify and then reallocate that soldier, you know, relay to them, hey, that's our guy or that's our target, that's what we need to focus on. Mm -hmm. you know, so this soldier as a sensor concept is truly coming to life now, which is really important. Another thing that you touched on that is more in my world also is the dual use side of it. I think that's a huge thing in the DOD, and I'll plug the OUSD for you now too, is they're leaning in <laughs> really hard into dual use technology. We've seen for decades now that industry is always leading the forefront of innovation, um, right? They have a very um, rapid, agile innovation protocol where traditionally we've had a, a waterfall type of innovation. We have to go through all these checks and balances, go from step one to step 50 in order to implement innovation and it, it kills it. Uh, so this dual use technology and 5U, 5G has really given the use cases here to be able to, to leverage that dual use technology because some of the key ones that you might see are things like smart cities. That's the, the hot topic right now for 5G on the commercial side. Well, if I change two things, I now have a smart fob, right? Now that makes a lot of, a lot of strategic difference um, to Bobby's point earlier about the logistics and, and the deployment of, of troops and assets. Another thing is autonomous cars. Everyone here has or wants a Tesla, right? <laughs> so what does that mean whenever I start to talk about UAS, UUVs, things like that? With 5G, whenever you differentiate, have a heterogeneous network, maybe I have a, a, an autonomous boat that I want to go out and do store and forward for data collection. And as it comes closer to the shore, it can do bulk data offload once it gets closer to the shore and connects to a, a commercial 5G network or your own personal 5G network. Maybe it's out on sea and it can't have access to that, so we need to leverage SATCOM backhaul. Right, this, this 5G architecture starts to outlay those kind of use cases that we see now with, the, with what commercial use is driving towards. So 
dual use is really leaning into let's innovate, let's push it, and then how can the DOD benefit from those uses? Right, and you, sorry, uh, I'll go real quick. <laughs> uh, but I, I'll just say now that like uh, a lot of the soldiers and warfighters now are, are digital natives like myself, and they're having to be trained on old analog technology like I, I wouldn't want you to picture me trying to use a rotary phone right now when I'm so used to like using a smartphone. Like I think even the hand sign change for a phone, it's now this. Yeah. In case you don't know, it's just holding the, holding the smartphone like that. Uh, but really, really getting tools that are comfortable to what warfighters are already used to, I, I mean that, that really plays a lot into uh, achieving their mission sets and I mean to your point about dual use you're not gonna get K through 12 engagement on analog DOD systems right you're gonna get engagement on their smartphones you're gonna get engagement on Alienware laptops and seeing what you can do with AR VR that, that's how you're going to get everyone interested in these problem sets I'd like to tag on to that too and, and that is um, uh, around the dual use of networks, right? So from a mission readiness standpoint, you may have you know, an F-22, F-35 that just landed, and you have that flight data that you really need to get back you know, off, off of that aircraft and get that sortie up. Secondly, you have aircraft ground equipment. So you have a 5G network that can download flight data very quickly and be able to prioritize what, what the next mission should and sh or should not be. But at the same time, you, you use that same network to, to locate where that aircraft ground equipment is on that flight line. Again, being able to provide uh, a better, not a vision, but more of a uh, making sure that mission, using the network for, for mission readiness and effectiveness. Yeah, and I'll just say for the education component too, that's, that's a huge thing that well we deal with mm -hmm. um, is how do we get people engaged like Will was talking about at a young age and we see um, a unique blend right now with entertainment and, and video games, right? It's, hey, to those guys, it's not latency, it's lag, right? I can't <laughs> lag. I'm playing Call of Duty, I can't lag or I'll get shot, right? So we can use 5G as a proxy to those kids to say, hey, we, we can cut out lag. You know, everyone's always wanting an Oculus now too and joining the metaverse. So we can say, how can we then use virtual or, auto, or augmented reality to start to say, hey, this is next generation PED, right? I, I can do full, full motion video analysts here in real time potentially, but you start them at the K through 12 with video games and things that are interesting to them. So we've done a lot of hackathons, a lot of use cases around those to get exposure of what is 5G and what are its benefits and, and it all falls to that dual use capability. Well, and I think that's a great point about the workforce. You know, if, um, if we don't develop students in the future workforce now, we won't have enough uh, qualified labor to fill the gaps. I mean, we're already seeing it currently. On Hawaii specifically, there's a huge problem with that. Um, oftentimes labor uh, is brought in from the mainland. They'll stay for a few years to support a contract and then they'll leave. Or you see a brain drain from Hawaii where the really smart kids will go away to school or take better jobs, you know, whether commercial or in the defense national security space. And so Hawaii um, specifically is losing that. So it's one of the things, you know, I'm focused on is looking at the local community and how can we start to connect all of those pieces from middle school, high school through university internship programs with different um, companies and things like that, contractors, all the way into the direct workforce, so. It's building that passion, right, at a young right. age and purpose. In a way that they relate to, yeah. which is exactly right, so. You know, Stephanie, that's, a, that's another great point. Um, I wrote down center of excellence. I think as we look at uh, Endopaycom, Kwajalein, you know, what, what the mission is, where it's going, um, building a, a center of excellence, you know, here, in Hawaii where we have not just the best technologies, but also you know, training the next generation um, of young women and men that, that can really help our and help continue to build our networks and sustain those networks over time. I wanna talk a little bit and kind of circle back to what I think each of you touched upon, the distributed and diversified backhaul. Um, Bobby, if you could kind of talk to SATCOM specifically in that, um, what do you see the role of SATCOM playing here? It's, it's going to be huge. I think we've heard the message um, this week with JADC2 and, and joint all-domain command and control, uh, redundant networks, resilient networks, 
non-terrestrial and terrestrial networks and ground domain networks, right? So, you know, one of the efforts that we're working on at Kwajalein is being able to architect, uh, design a, a new network, if you will, that also incorporates um, some of those underground you know, cable, fiber cables that we were talking about earlier, but that's just one piece of the puzzle. It's also understanding, you know, what that base does. It's very strategic um, as it relates to our ballistic missile defense, those systems, those substance systems, and that network, right? So being able to make sure uh, from a SATCOM standpoint, you know, that we not only have resilient, redundant comms, but being able to track, you know, different testing environments and test range assets that are out there um, as we continue to manage that, that operation. Um, the other part uh, of, of it, too, is when you look at SATCOM, you also have to understand, I think we know this, too, is working with the uh, International Telecommunications Union, the ITU, um, and understanding that when we are in theater, you know, we will need to have different types of communications from local carriers, right? So, you know, how do we do that? How do we have that already in place? We know about Link 16, but with, you know, new, new satellites going up, new birds that are flying, um, how do we architect not just the network itself, but have the communications with our allied and coalition partners to be able to have those communications? So from that standpoint, there's, there's three, you know, levels that I like to think about. One is, you know, the policies that are in place internationally um, with our coalition partners. Number two, um, the posture, right? So, you know, there's different types of postures of, that we all know about um, and, and, threat, and threats. And thirdly, um, you know, the procedures in order to implement these networks, these satellite networks and in conjunction with, with 5G as well. So, you know, there's... I think one thing that comes to mind is what we probably all know too is PBNM, policy-based network management. In SATCOM, in different theaters, in order to provide specific amounts of bandwidth for those applications, you need that bandwidth and you need to have those policies in place. So again, you know, the collaboration, the communication, not just with you know, the, the carriers themselves, but our coalition partners are gonna be key as we continue to, to, um, to provide the, the assets on, on site. Ooh. And one more, sorry. Go for it. Yep, go sorry. One more plug for the OESD initiative. So we we are definitely looking at all of those uh, resiliency points that you brought up, not just with SATCOM, but various forms of backhaul out at Lua Lua Lei as a part of Dr. Dan Massey's Operate Through initiative. The main initiative I'm a part of is enhancing aircraft mission readiness under Ms. Deb Stanislavski. And I am also, sorry, <laughs> pursuing another effort with Dr. Sumit Roy. So just a whole bunch of name drops there. You can count it as three for your OUSD counter. There was, there was a couple other points that I, I forgot to mention. Um, we talked about next generation, you know, future technologies where I think um, we know the word Starlink by now. But there are other companies that are, um, the industry is coming out with where they have applications that will, you know, connect user devices and sensors called, you know, a direct, um, direct connect over SATCOM. And it can be a game changer. And what that allows you to do, if you have that aircraft ground equipment out there on the flight line, you may or may not need a 5G network. You already have your, sat, your birds you know, in the sky, and you'll be able to, to literally um, be able to track different types of assets on the flight line uh, for your mission readiness. And then also, um, one of our other um, uh, verticals, and I think that's equally as important along with 5G and SATCOM, is Seaburn, uh, chemical, biological, radiological, uh, nuclear high-yield explosives. When you think about that, that acronym, Seaburn or Seaburnie, as some say, um, being able to have those sensors deployed you know, in theater to protect, you know, protect our warfighters, um, but also on island, right? You know, we, we all heard what happened the other year um, when, when they had the text message went out and many people were uh, you know, very, very afraid and that there, were potential, there was a potential for a nuclear attack here on the island. So um, being able to understand and integrate not just the Seaburn sensors, 5G, SATCOM, um, and, the, and being able to have that situational awareness where you, you know where those plumes are coming from or where they're going to go. So again, going back to, you know, it's a network of networks um, that we're trying to integrate and work, work towards. I'll just add a couple points to what you guys are saying too is, you know, it's 
there's current uh, leaders right now in the SATCOM in terms of um, who's first the show, but they're not the only one. And that's what's interesting too is OneWeb is coming up, um, Amazon Kuiper, or Project Kuiper, I believe is the name. I'm, there's a lot of proliferation that's going to happen here soon. And then we're also looking not only at Leo, but we're also looking at Mio op options. So whenever we get kind of in the further orbit um, capabilities, what does that do? Are we going full geo? Um, and then again, this 5G architecture can help kind of orchestrate all of these dissimilar capabilities. Um, another thing that SATCOM now is providing is what they call the inter-satellite link system, right? So do I want preferred backhaul capabilities? Do I, can I beam up to one satellite, hop across multiple satellites to then drop down and backhaul in a preferred location um, to avoid sensorization and things like that? So the SATCOM now field is offering a lot of unique capabilities as well as, you know, anytime there's a, a supply and demand kind of thing, you can drive the price down, drive capabilities up. So we're at an interesting inflection point with that as an option as well. Right. And I'll just talk real briefly on the dual use uh, applicability to that because, I mean, the, there's another RFP out from the state of Hawaii on expanding the undersea cable where I kind of see a better solution coming from proliferated lower earth orbit constellations and, and dropping that in traditionally underserved communities where it's not profitable for traditional telecommunications companies to actually trench fiber to reach like 50 folks. I, I mean, now you can just drop a terminal down uh, and service those 50 folks without having to even worry about any kind of mid-haul or how you're gonna get fiber out there. You, you can just service them through your P. Leo constellations, so a real quick note on that. I just being done on the protect side? I hear a lot of things that are vulnerable to PMI, electronic attack, et cetera, being an old electronic attack guy. What are we doing for the protect side of this? Because this, I heard smart fob. That opens up a whole new can of worms being a retired Marine. <laughs> That was my next question, so thank you very much. That's a great segue, so we can talk about so, security. <laughs> get up here, get up here. <laughs> Who wants to take that? I'll, I'll start. Um, you know, EMI, EMP, electromagnetic, X, right? Um, we tend to think that... Well, even before that, power, sure. right? Our, our grid, our grid, our grid right now is 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 in a state of trouble. I think we all, we all know that. So be, beyond just even having a 5G network or Satcom, it's how do we harden our, our utilities? Um, and and that's that's not obviously for this panel, but I mean it's it's in discussion. I'm I'm within I'm in the Beltway every week, and we have these discussions internally, but also with our DoD partners and what. And, and making sure that internally that we're also partnering with the right uh, folks in the industry to work on that for our FOBs and our bases um, as we do maintain and operate over 100 um, bases. And that's one of our um, initiatives as well. But going back to you know, 5G and SATCOM as it relates to hardening those, um, the network itself, besides power, we are also working with industry and it's, I would like to say that it's new, unfortunately, but it's in its infancy stages to be able to, t to protect um, some of our edge compute services and, and smaller form factors um, out at the edge with the carriers that will allow for, um, still to maintain comms on our, on our, on our operating basis. So it, it, we are working on it. It's one of our uh, strategic initiatives with, as, as Vectris, but as a whole, I think, you know, it's also part of the DOD to provide some of that um, as someone said earlier, the funding, you know, for that, right? So if we don't have the funding, you know, but it's, it's coming. It's coming down. I think we'll see some stuff coming out before November is what I'm hearing. In a joint exercise conducted with outside agencies, uh, a cyber attack on the power grid, this happened to have been South Carolina, 17 months before they could get it back up and operational with particular known attack. Yeah. Police chief, the head of the state police said, all our cruisers run off of smart well, I think part of the problem too in that instance is data sharing across the different um, organizations. You know, you have data collected at the state and local level that isn't necessarily shared or compatible with national agencies, and that can create a lot of problems. 
Yeah. Uh, one of the things we talked about was zero trust, especially with the edge IoT devices. Yeah. So who wants to take the big zero trust? Yeah. I can, I'll talk about it briefly. So zero trust architecture, right, is inherently ingrained into what we're doing now. So even if it's an ally, right, is we need to take a, a, a pro stance of saying, even though I know who you are, I still need to verify at every stage. Um, and, and doing that as a part of a best practice kind of helps um, initially mitigate some of those capabilities. Um, just to respond to the smart fob side of it too, there's new capabilities coming out too to where you can do RF emulation. Um, so you could actually then try to divert capabilities of a potential adversary to say, if I want to emulate an RF signature of a fob, can I put it on the back of a truck, drive the truck out 20 miles away, emulate the same exact signature so that way if it's targeted, they're hitting a truck, not my fob. You can be strategic with the implementation of those, characterize it the exact same way you'd need to on the fly. One of the key capabilities here is dynamic, so can I do it dynamically to map that? Um, but yeah, going back to the security, right, is there's a couple other technologies, application obfuscation. Can I move my front door on a lot of these things and constantly be able to make it um, more difficult? The reality with security is nothing is impossible if I have enough time, energy, or resources. Um, how can I just impede them and make it so monotonous? I, application obfuscation is one capability to do that, um, partnered with zero trust architecture. Yeah, um, final plug of the day, another OUSD initiative with the Camp Pendleton folks. They're, they're very much looking into all of these EWFX, but I mean, also when it comes to 5G, definitely hear you about all, I mean, with 5G, just because of its software-defined network, you're also expanding your attack surface, right? But on top of that, Zero Trust architecture is yet another Baskin Robbins store of flavors. So like you, you can apply many things, let's say containers. You, you can do a lot of things with Kubernetes and applying containerization and scanning those containers so you can have some kind of continuous monitoring. I mean, Cato, continuous authority to operate is a big term now in DoD. I think containers and software defined networks really lend itself to that. And also to that point of being disconnected, we should be able to work in a disconnected environment, which is your, where your resiliency comes in. So if you can spin up your network resources on a common compute platform and still be able to network with those in your immediate area, like think about uh, firefighters, yeah. for example, they can't reach their SATCOM because the smoke is too thick. So how are you going to be able to network there? I think it's a whole basket of tools that you can apply there. I mean, you can apply all the cybersecurity tools you want, but you'll still need ATFP and things like that. So to answer your question, there are a lot of tools to approach a lot of the problems that you're talking about, and it really depends on each specific use case. But really, 5G lends itself to giving you that flexibility to help you adapt to the various applications you might be looking into. I'll just say one more thing on that point about containerization. And, and you know, we talked about mech. What is mech? Without getting too detailed and into the weeds of it, it's not just an edge node. We've had servers for decades now. Um, one of the key functionalities of a mech itself is its ability to have control over its network and its, its routing schema and things like that too. So certain devices, if I want this device to stay only talking to this mech, I can trace everything like that. I can shut it off. I have dynamic control over what is on that, how it's communicating. I can run Docker containers with their, our own host of security. That inherently, the mech now provides a new capability of of security because I can set and partition that schema separately based off the device that's connected to. If I only want a radio connected specifically to this mech, I can set it up in its control plane such that nobody else coming from a certain side can necessarily come in and mess with that. So again, without getting too detailed, those are some ways now that this new technology of this, again, umbrella of 5G is kind of allowing that zero trust architecture and that res redundancy. You can get into things with multi-blade edge nodes to where you can have redundant blades that can do basically the same thing. So if one gets taken out, you could also do vSAN hypervisors to connect them all together to get massive compute if you need them. Again, all dynamically and all based in software now. So one, one last thing too. Um, earlier this year, there was an OTA by the, uh, I believe it was the National Spectrum Consortium, sorry, um, around um, providing 5G resilient, 5G resilient comms um, for 
with, with MANA, mobile ad hoc networks. Um, and I'll say that to, to say this, there are companies that are working on that, Shared Spectrum Corporation um, and, and, and several others that are doing some um, LPI, LPD, anti-jam, that have those types of capabilities that are building into the, uh, the OFDM and MAC layer of the um, of different devices. And then also, um, there may be another terminology that you may have heard or may not have, but it's called MBRI, Mobile Broadband um, Interface, which allows comms, uh, 5G comms specifically, um, without your terrestrial uh, network. So being able to, now the limitation to that is, okay, yeah, you have EMP bursts, the network goes down, but guess what? You still have communications from mobile device or UE to UE. Now the challenge from that perspective is the distance, right? So I'm sure we have, may have some AT&T folks in here from FirstNet, um, but they've been working on some stuff too where it's, you know, high power user equipment, when to be able to over transmit, if you will, um, from that device to be able to still link with another user device. So there, 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 there has been funding that's been available and, and also um, that proposal has, has gone out and I'm not sure who's gonna be awarded that or what have you, but the, it is coming. So that we are working on it. One final part about security too is um, with, with this kind of software defined nature, one of the things we can do is um, implement APIs now. The, these APIs are a huge thing. And so one of the things we talked about earlier, message-based encryption. I can actually use an API to do message-based encryption. It's not embedded security, it's completely different. So I can start to layer security on itself. Message-based encryption to where I can, if I know who it's going to, I send them the keys ahead of time. I can, it's actually tunable. So if, if I have comms that I need locked down completely secure, I can tune my, I can go down to every packet that I want to send as its own generated key. Or if I need to make sure it needs to be secure, but it needs to get there within, you know, eight milliseconds to, to act on, I can dial my encryption back, make sure it's still encrypted, right? So maybe they're only getting, you know, packet by packet, you know, three words out of the sentence, so to speak, and they can't figure out the rest of it, or maybe I need to do every word. Um, so the API level of this actually allows a new capability for us to not only have the infrastructure security like that um, Bobby was talking about, um, then we could start to talk about now network security built in. So I do want to offer if there's any questions from the audience, we do have microphones or, you know, feel free to engage. Um, we're coming we heard to you the, loud and clear. Though. Wait, yeah, we yeah. did. That was great. <laughs> We've also been getting a lot of questions through the email system. Whenever you're ready to go, we've got about a dozen queued up. Sure, we can pull those up. Thank you. Tina, we're going till 3.30. Okay, all right. Love the setup, by the way. <laughs> I, I had no idea what all the other panels were looking at, but it was. <laughs> <laughs> now you know. One quick thing as we go to uh, questions too, you know, one of the key things we talk about is the next thing in our thing, we're already talking 6G, which is hilarious, right? It's like we've <laughs> barely learned how to spell 5G and all the R1 institutions are 6G. Okay, great, we get it, that's their job. Our jobs are to implement 5G, practical 5G. Um, what is 5G.1 or 5G.5.1G look like? <laughs> uh, you know, these, thi these are the things on the horizon, the things like National Spectrum Consortium and some, some other initiatives are trying to answer, things like dynamic spectrum sharing. Um, obviously, we're constantly implementing carrier aggregation, MIMO capabilities to expand our, our throughput capabilities, but how can I dynamically change my spectrum? Radio, uh, software defined radios. Um, that's stuff that we're looking at now, too, is gone are the days of where I, I only had one physical hardware radio that can only output you know, one capability. Now I can tune that. Our filters have gotten much better, so I think we've all heard of the C-band FCC FAA fiasco that's going on. Um, there's things now with our filters that are so tight in terms of um, fuzz that we can actually, with that one, it's a 50 megahertz guard band. Typical guard bands are in the one to five range. Mm -hmm. And even then, their, their hard, almost stepwise function falls off, fall off because of our software filters. So um, those are things that are coming. Obviously, for 6G, one of the big capabilities that they're looking at is the terahertz spectrum. Um, and we're talking about terabits per second speeds, one terabit per second. Um, that's going to come with its own host of problems, you know, again, down to propagation length and things like that. But that's what's on the horizon and things that they're actively looking at. But us guys up here, we're looking at how to actually get the, the warfighter their capabilities with 5G. Yeah, and I might even argue that the fight for 6G has already started yeah. because of 5G. I mean, one good uh, definition I've heard of 6G is that 
6G is about networking things not necessarily traditionally meant to be networked together. So I, I think 5G being able to distribute this compute platform across devices which normally would not have such compute, uh, you're already starting on the fight for 6G. I, I mean, it sounds like it's already here. We're just putting a new sticker on it to attract <laughs> more money and innovation. The, the word there is heterogeneous <laughs> network of networks yes. is actually the term that they've coined for that. So let's take 5G and make a lot of 5Gs and tie it together in 6G. I'm just waiting for the nice acronym to come out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Acronyms are 50% of the battle. <laughs> so I can see the question here, but could we get it on the small screen here? Okay. Uh, so the question is, with all of 5G's innovation potential, how do we avoid thinking conventionally about how to use it? Question. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll take that. I'll take a, a crack at it. Um, Conventionally, you know, I'll use 5G smart warehouse uh, as an example. Conventionally, it's been um, pencils, papers, and clipboards, right? And that's just not going to get the job done in our, not just for our forward operating bases, but for any of our, our warehouses. Um, we have to be able to have and utilize these new technologies and implement these new technologies uh, to be more effective for the mission. So from a 5G smart warehouse standpoint, being able to not just locate uh, shipments and, and receiving um, different types of materials, but it's also being able to prioritize those shipments, those materials, and going from one base to another called the, uh, the connected smart warehouse, the 5G smart warehouse um, connected bases um, platform that you know, we as Vectors are working on um, to help, you know, not just you know the army and but all of our all of our um, uh, armed forces. So conventionally, again, you know, paper and pencil is just not getting it, and it's still out there. Um, clipboards, it's just not it's not efficient. It's not effective. We have seen millions of dollars lost at our bases because we don't know where these assets and materials are. It's proven. Um, you know, look at Coronado, for example. Um, we, we know the numbers and, and the numbers don't lie. So as we look to you know, use our new technologies, 5G and other, and other types of technologies, and also keep in mind, there's Wi-Fi, there's RTLS, there's LiDAR. It's really a converged environment that we have to be able to, you know, to, to, be able to integrate. Um, so again, it's, it's being able to, you know, the one-liner there is looking at this converged environment, all of these technologies and being able to deploy it so that we can have the right um, mission of readiness and effectiveness. Right, and I'll just, Coronado, another OUSD initiative. Uh, but real quickly, to, to answer this question, I mean, I, I wouldn't say you need to avoid thinking about conventional uses for 5G. You're just finding a digital uh, synonym, uh, what's the word, synonym, uh, no to your analog, right? What you just brought up with pencil and paper, there's an Excel version of that. And if you find yourself uh, doing something over and over again, you can automate that, right? So, I mean, it's just, I, I think it was put best where in order to just get more comfortable with it, you just have to start using it and operating it in that environment and I think 5G is really the first step in getting access to that environment and working with it so you can find clever ways to do it. I mean, I can give you some things that I've thought about, but it's not going to be everything. So I, I definitely think that you'll be able to find the best uses for 5G as you begin to use it more and as it becomes being uh, deployed more widely. Yeah, we, we tell people in our lab with our partners all the time is, Let's not think about 5G first. You tell me what your problem is, and I'll show you how 5G can solve it. Um, so there's, there's great companies and great initiatives like with the OUSD that have, have set up strategic locations to be able to, to be that resource. Another way to really think of 5G is, to their point, stop thinking about 5G as 4G+. Plus. It's, it's not the same thing. It's really, what if I told you I could get you real-time data insights on anything you want? What's your unicorn wish list? You know, oh, I wish I could do this. You know, if I'm a manufacturer, oh, I wish I could have real-time energy insights. I wish I could have operational equipment efficiency. Great, let me show you how to solve it with 5G. 
Maybe it's targeting data. Maybe I need to, to increase my response time. Or I need to get this ped back, but I have a pipe too small. Great, let me show you how to do it with 5G. So it's really about you know, the bigger scheme of there's data all around us. Our, the, the unicorn goal that we always wish we could have is how do we get everything out here, filter out what we don't want, take what we do want, compress it or pre-process it, and get it to where it needs to go. That's 5G. In a secure way. In a secure way. Yeah. Oh, big, big one. one. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay. Can I, All right. I guess I can read it, but chain. you can see it too. So uh, what about the potential for better connectivity across our own island chain? So I think right. this one goes back to the point about uh, potential mesh networks and kind of distributed node capability. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that we can do here is if we can start to distribute among, among the island chains, and then we can you know, connect those together into either one unified network um, or if we want them separated for certain capabilities, um, that is a potential now with 5G. And then, and then again, they're all scalable. So in one use case, do you want millimeter wave? Do you want mid-band? Do you want a different backhaul? Because it's all software defined now, you have the capability of aggregating those together into a single network. Well, and Will, do you want to mention the broadband HUI and some of the initiatives? Oh, yeah. So the state of Hawaii has a broadband HUI, which is like a weekly group of folks that come together, all the stakeholders on the island, uh, they work out precisely this uh, question that we have up here about digital equity across the islands because definitely Oahu has the largest presence for defense and tourism and most of the technology, if we can call it that. Um, but. <laughs> I, I mean, really, that's a good forum for you to take this question, but personally, how I see this, it's exactly everything what Michael said. I, I mean, and I'll push on top of that, the increase of telework, being able to connect and remote into digital resources that may be on Oahu or otherwise. Those are great opportunities for folks on the neighbor islands with good connectivity through a proliferated Leo SATCOM terminal or something like that, or free space optics, ooh, fun technology, uh, for us to be able to get access to those resources and innovate in those environments. So that's my two cents yeah. there. But. Well, I was going to ask you a question, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, <laughs> if you can maybe even speak to you know, Joint Base Pearl Harbor and you know, what, five, what types of efforts have been going on here on the island as it relates to, to DOD and, um, and 5G? Right, so I, I think our, our approach is unique even to the OUSD initiative is because a lot of the network we're relying on is in the commercial side. So using COTS equipment, I mean, too often I feel like in the DOD we've in, tried to independently, independently form solutions mm -hmm. Uh, where industry is just moving so much faster. And you've heard the calls for help here, which is like, hey, help us think of ways to innovate here, right? Like, we want to ride on your coattails and do everything great that the industry is doing. So I, I think the Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam 5G initiative is a good step on that path because we're taking advantage of the commercial networks that are available today using user equipment that is on shelves now, like think a Samsung S22, iPhone 13. I'm not promoting any of these companies specifically, but you, you get my idea. Getting them in the hands of warfighters, seeing what they can do with it. Things like, how do I diagnose this problem on an aircraft where I'm not qualified for the skill level, but someone who is, is all the way in the back in the mainland. Do I want to fly them all the way out here? and add days to my turnaround time, or do I just call them on FaceTime and show them the problem and they give me a fix in half an hour? That's the capability that we're looking at leveraging here. Uh, I mean, we're also going to have a private instance uh, out at Naval Air Station, Whidbey Island. That's also a part of our purview. It just sounds like that I'm slowly extending my influence <laughs> across all of the OUSD initiatives, but that's not the case, I swear. Uh, we, we, have, we are experimenting with private mech and being able to reach the, the private resources through any kind of transport, essentially being transport agnostic uh, using commercial equipment. So one, uh, one other capability that we haven't spent much time on today that, that can answer this question in a slightly different way too is network slicing. How can I create non-duplicative assets? So can I deploy a 5G network and then employ network slicing to then say, 
whether I'm Pearl Harbor Hickam, I'm going to have, it's probably a bad example because they're going to they're want their own network, <laughs> but can I designate 50 megahertz of, of, of band to this specific user to have a guaranteed amount of throughput that they need and then keep either other slices available for general users, public use, um, telehealth, um, things like public library as well. That's another use case we're seeing on the commercial side is um, instead of handing out hotspots and things like that to people that need inter internet, what if we do uh, 5G you know, connectivity instead of just Wi-Fi type of thing. So having, having their own dedicated network slice also helps with assured you know, throughput that you may need with this connectivity. Um, and then again, you're not duplicating assets. You know, so, something else too, um, as we look at 5G and, and um, like the Oahu is the technology center of gravity for DOD, part of these networks are the user devices, the tablets. You mentioned um, Samsung devices and, and iPhones. Um, we just can't use all those devices on our network it's interesting in, in the fact that the NIAP list has really, um, you know, it's a list that basically says, hey, guess what? These devices have been certified through the NSA and can only be allowed on our, on our networks. And for, you know, technolo for technologists and companies and industry, you know, for testing purposes, yes, we may be able to test um, those devices, but when it comes to full-scale full production, you know, we have to abide by, you know, some of these, uh, these processes that are in place, but they're, they're for a good reason. They're, they're, to, they're for security purposes. Um, so I just wanted to touch upon that as well. Yeah, and I'll just foot stomp uh, what, the, what the joint panel said yesterday about how slow the RMF process is. We definitely need to revolutionize that policy because it is, it is policy from the 90s and we're trying to apply it to 2022 technology. Yes. So, <laughs> I hope. I sure hope. Oh yeah. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Did we have another question? Oh, here we go. How will 5G help reduce power consumption across our networks in forward locations, austere locations, and remote yes. bleeding edge combat locations? Yeah. So I, I think I'll, I'll take a first stab at that. One more plug for the OUSD initiative. Uh, so we are working on a 5G transit case based system where we're able to miniaturize uh, a lot of these 5G services onto a transit case system that can be handled and operated by warfighters. So it's a very small footprint and you'll see that the simplicity makes it very usable and applicable to a lot of these forward locations where you wouldn't even want to have a fob out there. So I, I mean, amongst just other the, the other smart use technologies of reducing power consumption, I, I think that's also a brilliant way is like effic efficiently managing your network resources uh, in this software defined environment and being able to spin up and spin down containers based on your mission sets, you efficiently use power in that manner as well. That's a, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. The ability to rapidly spin up or spin down capabilities is, is what really helps distributing compute so that way you're not streaming all of data that may not be relevant. Can I pre-process at the edge so that way I don't have constant just <laughs> export of data? But really it's that, that rapid configuration and teardown that, that a 5G offers you. Um, an analogy, Wi-Fi 6 is doing the same thing as well. You know, um, one of, that's one of the key components here is a reduction in power, but it, it has to do with this dynamic capability of the network to spin up resources and spin them down. Yeah, it, it's almost like um, the, the, the phrase is network in a box, right? So being able to have a 4G, 5G solution in a box that, you know, to, to, to Will's point, um, that it's rapidly deployable. You know, there are solutions that, that we're looking at industry to, to get those solutions for so that we can have, you know, b basically taking the network to, to the fight, right? So not relying on the, the host nation to provide that, that network. And again, that requires, you know, SATCOM and then also 5G. Something else too, um, you know, from a DOD perspective is that when we look at 5G standalone, it, it, that was kind of the, the, the race, right? In the last two years in tranche one. And also what we're seeing now is even though 4G is still here, live and breathing, um, we're also looking at still being able to integrate 4G services and 4G devices 
um, on, on the network as well, which is interesting because that requires a different type of network as well. For, for those that know EPC is, that, um, is that, that, that capability of being able to have both 4G and 5G uh, networks kind of coinciding on the same network. So it's, it's a combination of looking at, yes, we have 5G today, but we also have to integrate 4G services and applications as well. One, uh, one thing we've talked about too in some of my other initiatives is uh, accept, uh, change exception. So there's ways to gather data that has to do with, um, am I constantly just pulling data and seeing and transmitting, or am I looking for changes in the data I'm already getting? One use case would be if I'm doing ISR and PED on a target, I don't necessarily care if that target is always there. I care when they move. So that's another way to be more efficient with consumption and throughput capabilities is only report to me when things aren't where they once were at the last data set. Um, so that's again at the, at, the, at the user end, right, or the application layer, but those are ways you can build in uh, lower power consumption and the uses. Oh yeah, and I'll just quickly plug uh, event-based imaging. Yep. Yeah, so re really brings down your resource consumption. Yep. You're only monitoring change and you're reducing the data that's actually flowing in. And I'll throw a really nice acronym at you called the PONY. That's the 5G transit case system I just said. The Portable Operations Network Integrator. You'll see it on the street soon. <laughs> OUSD, one more. Uh, with the idea in mind that every warfighter is a sensor, so I know Michael, you said that. Um, what opportunity do you see to utilize the compute of a 5G capability device? Yeah, this is uh, one that Will and I talked about a couple days ago quite extensively too on. Um, we've kind of added a new acronym now to what we call uh, PAN, right? So you have WAN, LAN, and now PAN, which is personal area network. Um, to Will's point, kind of just the way technology goes, now you know our cell phones have more compute power than the space shuttle had. Yep. Um, so how can I leverage that compute um, to do that kind of on-prem compute pre-processing capability? Um, it's just kind of one way that we could use kind of what's in their pocket. Again, sensor, uh, uh, sensorization too is also just scaling down to the micro and nano scale basically now too. So um, lower power consumption, uh, more efficient transport of the data, pre-processing to the soldier, um, and again, the mass configurability of that. So what data am I wanting, right? One soldier in one area versus one sailor in another area are gonna want different data. Um, so you can kind of configure that again via sensors and via software of, of what you're trying to collect. So really trying to see, again, this network arch architecture of what's my WAN, what's my LAN, and then what's my PAN now on the personal aspect um, to then be able to leverage. Well, and I think it's really interesting. You know, we're talking about um, information collecting from a hardware sensor, but there's so much development happening in the Army, for example, at DEVCOM with uh, smart fabrics. Yep. So you could have a soldier in the field who not only has devices, uh, mobile tactical communication hardware, but also collecting data from his or her person, right, on, on these smart fabrics. So the amount of data coming back that needs to be processed, collated, uh, disseminated is, is immense. Yeah, passive sensors are becoming huge. Piezoelectrics capabilities like that is how, do they, how can we pull from things that maybe don't even pull power or have minimal power? You know, part, part of that edge compute is, is the swap. Right, so being able yep. to have not just Kubernetes and mobile edge compute, but it's it's the actual swap of the device. I think we all saw through NetWarrior what some of those capabilities can kind of come out to be, and have that that, that warfighter as a sensor, um, but also it's the applications that will you know coexist not just on the 5G side of the house, but the, from an application standpoint, locating you know where that warfighter is, health monitoring. Um, all those types of capabilities will, will need to be addressed, you know, from the edge and being back, being able to have that data, um, you know, trans transported back over the network to get a real-time, um, you know, footprint of the situational awareness. So. so we do have about 10 minutes left. I want to give all the panelists an opportunity to have some closing remarks. Bobby, if you want to start. Sure. Um, you know, th number one, thank you for uh, inviting us out here and um, really glad to be here. As we look into our own crystal ball and we talked about 6G and 5G, um, one thing that hits home for me the most is, you know, being able to, to give back, I think, um, you know, Vectris plug here, but, you know, being able to collaborate with, you know, OUSD and, and the rest of the team um, and learn more about what's going on within our industry. Um, you know, we, we know some of the big names 
Um, but then there's a lot of names that we don't know. And I think one of the communications that, were, that we all heard yesterday was being able to collaborate a lot more and, and have extended, you know, extend your, your technology ecosystems. Yes, we all want to win the OTAs and RPPs, but also we want to be able to create a solution that, that meets the requirements of, of our DOD uh, partners. Um, so that's number one. Number two, when I also say give back, um, is you know we as vectors are looking at you know endopaycom because yes we do have a presence here, but also looking at endopaycom as um, as a center of excellence and how can we build a center of excellence you know here in in this arena in this theater um, to support you know our DoD partners and also the island. Um, and being able to provide, you know, some of that technology training that we, we talked about earlier, internship opportunities, it, it goes a long way to be able to have, you know, technology engineers or young engineers locally, you know, to be able to still support some of these efforts that we're working on. And then thirdly, um, from a technology standpoint, it's never going to stop. And you know, though we, we all have great experience here, I'll be the first one to tell you I don't know everything about 5G, but what I, what I do know is that we're, we're on a very fast pace um, in learning and understanding and trying to figure out what, not only what, what the 5G network should or shouldn't do, again, going back to is it, is it a strategic network, is it an operational 5G network, or is it a tactical network? Um, but also really understanding that at the, end, at the end of the day, we're trying to serve our, our DOD customers and partners to be able to bring, you know, the best network possible, you know, to the edge, at sea, on land, and in air, right, for mission effectiveness. So, um, again, thank you very much and really appreciate the time. Yeah, so I'd first like to just thank AFSIA for thinking that I know enough to be on this panel and feeding my imposter syndrome there, so thank you. Uh, but it, it's, it's really exciting to be working on 5G. I mean, everyone you speak to has 5G fever. It's really become this rallying cry for everyone to really take a look at how we do business and how we can do it better. I mean, uh, one last time, I promise. I'll plug the OESD initiative, but it's exciting to be part of this cutting edge technology and getting this latest and greatest technology into the hands of the people that need it the most. Warfighter or not, we're getting solutions in the hands of people and I, I think that was my core oath I took as an engineer. So, I mean, I really just have to thank Everyone that got me here, I, I really appreciate being on the panel, really appreciate Steph and AFSIA for having us here, and really thank the OUSD initiative for giving me the opportunity to work on cutting edge technology all in paradise. Thank you. I'll just say uh, closing remarks is just remember 5G is not one thing. It is a basket of technologies that all simultaneously coexist to provide the end goal. Um, with that being said, um, we were talking just the other day, the acronym I love to use on this is it's no longer a real estate war. You know, back then we had a finite amount of land to play. Now that we're in the digital age and we're in this virtual environment, there's enough room for everyone to collaborate and succeed at the same time. Um, so it's awesome to see like all these boosts out there, again, people ranging from spectrum to edge to IT to networking, and those all can coexist and even competitors within the same field there's enough problem sets out there that we all can have success because we all can't be experts, just like Bobby was saying, we all can't be experts in everything. Um, so I think this you know, fourth industrial revolution called um, advanced networking is really allowing us to see the benefit of everyone coming together, and the term we use is collaborate via, via collision. Let's just get in and talk about hard problems that need solved, and who do we know in our networks that can solve them? So. Thank you all for being here, and thanks for uh, staying until the very end. <laughs> <laughs> I echo that. Um, mahalo nui loa. Thank you all so much for staying. I know this is yeah. you know, the end of the conference, but I think this was a wonderful discussion. Thank you to the panelists, and thank you to FCA for recognizing the role that emerging leaders play. You know, a, a little plug for us, it's sort of the, that next generation and the future of the workforce, and I think FC has done a great job empowering and spotlighting some, yeah. some really great folks here today, so thank you very much. I'll turn it back to Tina.
Stephanie, it is our pleasure. You all are the future of our association, so we certainly appreciate, and uh, our future is in good hands with folks like this, so thank you very much. So you've held on this long. I have about two minutes worth of comments in closing, and then we will uh, all be on our way. But first of all, again, Stephanie, thank you so much for putting this panel together. Michael, William, and Bobby, thank you so much for spending your time with us today and sharing your insights. A few more thanks, uh, words of thanks to Ed Rigowitz, who's the regional vice president for the, uh, the, oh, he's in the back waving. Thank you, Ed, for your leadership to this region and to this chapter. Linda Newton, thank you for your leadership to the chapter as the president of the Hawaii chapter. And uh, thank you to all of the amazing volunteers of the Hawaii chapter that worked with the FCA team to make this possible. It would not have happened without a lot hard work of many, many people, so thank you. So another thing of thanks I get to, as a thank you uh, to each of you, I have the privilege of presenting you with the challenge coin, the uh, Hawaii chapter's challenge coin that commemorates the 36th anniversary of TechNet Indo-Pacific. We will take, uh, have T TechNet Indo-Pacific 2022 is going to take place back here at the Hilton Hawaiian Village November 1st through 3rd. So we look forward to seeing you in November. We thank you so much for staying with us today. Until we can be together again, if you're off island, travel safely. Stay positive, test negative. Mahalo, take care, thank you.